Hi everyone, um, and I'd like to welcome you to our new climate and development webinar series. Uh, this is the first in our series, um, and I'd like to um, welcome Helen Davies, um, who is the Chief Director for the Green Economy for the Western Cape Government. Um, Helen, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us today. Um, Helen's going to be talking about the Western Cape Municipal Energy Resilience Initiative and working towards further renewable energy generation. So from our side, if you have any questions for Helen during the presentation, then please could you feel to free to put them into the chat box and we'll also op open it up for questions um, at the end. So I'm going to now hand over to Helen, um, who will be presenting to us today. Thanks so much, Helen. Great. Thanks very much for the uh, welcome, Debbie, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I'm just going to give you an overview or an update, I think, for many of you on the Municipal Energy Resilience uh, Initiative. Um, apologies for some of you who have been in other seminars and things. Some might be repetitive, uh, but let's let's see how we go. But I think what would be interesting is discussion as well in terms of uh, some of the tricky issues that we're facing um, and we'd love some discussion and inputs in terms of ideas around how those should be resolved. I'm going to switch off my camera for now and then if you can just confirm Debbie that you can see the presentation in presentation mode. Hi Helen, yes it's perfect, you, you're good okay. to go. Great stuff, all right yeah. So yeah just in terms of introductory um, I mean, these are self-explanatory, but it's it's just we always like to put this as the context um, because often when we talk about energy resilience, um, uh, certainly for some of the principles in Western Cape government, government, it's seen as what can you do immediately to stop load shedding right now. Um, so our context setting is that the energy crisis isn't a simple crisis to resolve. Uh, the situation will not be resolved quickly. The solutions lie in a complete overhaul of the power sector, and that is underway. So including the unbundling of ESCOM, increasing diversification and decentralization of energy. Um, and lastly, that the regulatory process and other changes needed are radical and they are happening at an unprecedented rate. Um, and so a lot of the, the messaging that we, we try to give to all those we engage with, particularly those who aren't uh, deeply involved in the energy sector, is there is a lot that's changing and underway and at a, a rate not seen before. And then also to provide clarity from the start is when we speak about energy resilience, it's not only energy security, uh, but it's also about the affordability of energy and the lower carbon nature of energy. So in terms of context setting, um, as we all know, the or many of us, the energy security and reliability future continues to look severe. Uh, we've had more load shedding in the first six months of this year than we had in the whole of 2021. Um, this table on the right is one that ESCOM publishes, I think, on a weekly basis um, with planned risk levels of outages um, and then likely risk scenario. That likely risk scenario is affected by anything from the age of plant to plant breakdowns, sabotage, incident strike action, etc. Um, <clears throat> so at the moment we're seeing that it's likely that at least uh, stages one or two will continue for the rest of this year. Um, but if there are further unplanned breakdowns, we could see more than stage two. <clears throat> that moves on to the last one around decommissioning of multiple coal ESCOM plants. And here this slide just indicates uh, the decommissioning plan of a number of ESCOM's plants. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, I'm just getting over a bug. Um, the decommissioning of a lot of ESCOM's plants. Um, uh, a number of the uh, of ESCOM's plants uh, have not been compliant with uh, the country's minimal emission standards. Um, so that together with unplanned breakages or breakdowns, etc., might mean that some of this decommissioning is brought even further forward. But essentially what it means is that we already have an energy shortfall and that shortfall will, um, will be greater as these plants become decommissioned. In terms of what load shedding means, there are often questions in terms of um, you know why we have load shedding and what each stage means um, and it's essentially around I mean load shedding is helping to manage the system so that there isn't a complete failure in the system so as we move from load shedding shedding stages one two three and uh, well, four and six it's based on how much uh, energy needs to be kind of uh, demand needs to be reduced off the system 
So stage one, it's up to 1,000 megawatts, two up to 2,000, four, 4,000, and six, 6,000. And then that obviously is spread out over different uh, length of time over different periods of the day. But essentially, the amount that ESCOM has to supply has been uh, significantly reduced by planned or unplanned maintenance, which affects the capacity and results in the capacity um, being outstripped by the demand each day. In terms of why energy resilience matters, I mean, uh, in for us, economic impact is, is the key one of the key matters that we highlight um, that it's calculated that GDP last year was reduced by 3%, um, a potential loss of 350,000 job losses um, due to load shedding. Uh, the costs based on ESCOM's figures are that uh, in the Western Cape, load shedding costs us 75 million rand per stage per day. But what's important to note is as we move into higher levels of load shedding, uh, that cost, is, cost to the economy escalates quite dramatically. Um, part of that is due to businesses that operate continuous processes and they can't operate on a stop start manner that load shedding requires. In terms of financial sustainability, what we are seeing is uh, as customers move on, uh, move on to their own generation systems, uh, municipalities lose some of their electricity income. And so municipal financial sustainability is put at risk unless those municipalities become part of the new system. We could also see high financial costs. Um, so for example, sunk, sunk costs, diesel, et cetera, if we focus on um, relieving the immediate uh, electricity constraints. Um, so if we think in terms of the short term versus medium to long term, uh, we can actually undo ourselves financially. Uh, and then obviously also there's an impact on consumers around the affordability of rising electricity costs, whether those consumers be businesses or households. Um, I think most of the people in this room are more than well aware of the high carbon intensity um, of South Africa's uh, energy, or high, high energy or carbon footprint. Um, and the impact that has on the economy in turn is that it increases the price of exported goods. So a lot of our target markets particularly in their post-COVID recovery plans, um, have put in carbon pricing tools, um, so carbon border adjustments or others. For the Western Cape, four out of our six top export markets uh, that equate to 53% of our exports already have at least two carbon pricing tools in place. And obviously over time, they'll inc inc increase um, the number of sectors that are covered by those tools, et cetera. Um, and what that means is we're essentially placing a huge focus of our economic recovery plans for the province on increasing exports. Um, but if we're not taking account of the need to reduce the carbon footprint of the businesses in the Western Cape, um, then we could be setting them up for failure um, in the medium to longer term. And right now, the, we're seeing increasing pressure in the Western Cape from multinationals and then businesses in the supply chain of those multinationals towards carbon neutrality. Um, so the immediate requests that we seem to be getting now are partly uh, for immediate uh, relief from load shedding um, and, and more and more from businesses that are needing to toward, move towards carbon neutrality. I'm not going to go through the detail of the slide, but it's just to point out that there have been significant uh, structural changes, policy and regulatory changes since 2020 that have all really opened the space uh, for a changing energy um, a general changing energy field in the country. Um, so everything from amending, <coughs> excuse me, the licensing requirements for renewable energy plants um, through to the REAP bid windows. Uh, bid window five, there have been delays in the financial close uh, of that program, but I think that's moving forward now. And bid window six, uh, the closing date for which has been extended um, to be able to take on more capacity in bid window six, uh, should the national minister approve that. But there have been some fundamental changes, um, and a lot of what we're trying to do within the municipal energy resilience work in the Western Cape is to take advantage of those changes and understand what they mean. So broadly, the slide describes a brief indication as to how the electricity supply system has worked in the past. Um, so coal power stations taking a long time to complete. Sorry, start up here that the bulk of energy electricity in the country is produced by ESCOM from coal power plants. Um, Kuburg and hydroelectric plants are also used, um, some of those out the country. Coal power stations take a long time to complete and incredibly expensive. 
ESCOM's National Transmission Network is equivalent to the size of Europe's. Uh, so it's a significant, a significant transmission network. Uh, and then the distribution by electricity is by of electricity is by ESCOM or local municipality. And businesses and household demand at the moment in the Western Cape is growing by 3%. And 80% of the energy consumed in the Western Cape is within the city of Cape Town Metro. So a lot of our work, we work closely with the city of Cape Town and they're a core part of the MER. But importantly, we also need to work with other municipalities um, to strengthen their own economies so that we don't have increasing urbanization um, at the expense of the other municipalities in the province. In terms of how the space is fundamentally changing is that low carbon sources are increasingly coming online. The private sector is playing a huge role uh, in this space and the more we open up the regulatory environment um, and uh, other enabling factors, the more we enable the private sector to play a role in this new system. There's a lot of money available in foreign aid. Uh, what we don't necessarily have is the coordinated mechanism, certainly within the province, to be able to bring in that foreign aid and attract it and link it to the right projects. ESCOM is splitting their business into the three companies of generation, transmission and distribution that's underway at the moment. Municipalities <clears throat> to generate their own power uh, and they can support local initiatives to wheel from other locations. Uh, so that's happening to a greater or less extent in different municipalities across the country. But there is a threat to their revenue and the fear from municipalities is how big that impact will be and how they could mitigate that impact. Importantly and increasingly, households can generate their own power from solar and wind and businesses can procure and will be allowed to increasingly procure energy on the, op the open market. So the bottom line is that power is now injected from third parties at hundreds or even thousands uh, more locations. Uh, in a summary, it's essentially showing the traditional power system um, that's going to be transformed by distributed and decentralized and diversified energy resources. The recent Meridian Economics <clears throat> study, uh, which was published in June this year, indicated or calculated that five gigawatts of renewable energy would have decreased load shedding by 96.5% last year. And it really sees the fundamental um, move towards addressing load shedding um, in the short term and medium term and longer term is around adding more renewable energy to the grid. And through that also reducing the impact of, of using <clears throat> excuse me, the fuels that are used for peaking capacity in the system. But be that as it may, we know the Chinese proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Our version of that is the best time to install a renewable energy source was 20 years ago and the second best time is now. So we're not going to um, beat around and focus on what didn't happen in the past, but rather really focus on how we move forward now. Uh, there's been a huge increase in power generation registrations with NERSA following the licensing exemptions um, and the follow on from us uh, within uh, at a provincial government is to work with municipalities to see what requirements uh, there are for those projects to potentially connect into municipal grids and how we make sure that municipal municipalities are able and willing um, to take these new plants through their, their grids. Uh, the Meridian Economics paper also gave, in terms of short-term release relief from uh, load shedding, a breakdown of key interventions that were required and the kind of scale that's required for those. So we then take that and say, right, if Western Cape is using almost 10% of the country's energy, what is our, in brackets, kind of fair share um, to um, kind of help meet these capacity requirements? Um, so this is the 10% figure um, and on the right hand side is just the progress in the Western Cape towards those. But what we do recognise is that um, not all provinces or metros in the country will be able to necessarily contribute towards this. So our aim is not just to go for this 10%, but to really say what is the most that we can do that will contribute to the country's energy resilience. <clears throat> in terms of what is based in the Western Cape, um, on the small scale side, we're less than one megawatt. In the last 18 months, there's been 98 megawatts of registered PV um, installed in the, the Western Cape. What we do note, however, is the city, um, their estimations or calculations are that only 50% of PV systems that are being installed in the city have been registered. 
Um, so we know that this is an underestimation of uh, what's actually been installed. We continue to support the revision of feed-in tariffs, and we're also looking increasingly to streamline the registration process around rooftop PV. In terms of distributed generation and 100 megawatt segment, um, we'll speak further to this, but essentially the city's uh, IPP process is currently out in the market for 200 megawatts, um, and they've seen significant interest from the private sector. Uh, we're also working with Stellenbosch Municipality, which we'll speak to more just now, and their wheeling projects underway with pilots in both the city and George, which could uh, unlock substantially more energy in that space. In terms of REAP, so this is the national program, but these are just the, the size of the projects that um, are based in the Western Cape, it is 592 megawatts. That's up to the end of bid window five operational in the Western Cape. 785 megawatts of projects were approved in bid window five. Um, those haven't yet reached financial close. And we expecting stroke hoping for um, significantly more projects in bid window six due to the fact that there's currently still ESCOM grid capacity available in the province. Demand response is something that we haven't yet looked at and we need to see whether we need to play in that space. In terms of battery storage, two of ESCOM's battery energy storage projects, uh, utility scale pilot projects are based in the Western Cape. And then in terms of peaking capacity, we have some from ESCOM, but then also the Stembrus project through City and City's dispatchable um, RFP that is due to go out either the end of this year or early next year. So to give you a sense of how this fits into the renewable, in, into the, the MER initiative, um, the Western Cape's been driving energy resilience work for a long, long time. Um, and, you know, this is Western Cape government, but it's also with a number of different partners. Um, so it's certainly not taking credit for all uh, that's been implemented to date, um, but just to flag in terms of small scale embedded generation frameworks. We now have those in place in 22 Western Cape municipalities, there's 69 in the country as a whole. Feed-in tariffs we have for 21 municipalities, there's 33 in the country. Uh, the frameworks and, and <clears throat> feed-in tariff calculations that have been used um, at our provincial level are being used nationally. Um, and I've spoken to the systems that have been registered in the last 18 months. We do have a big challenge to, uh, to flag this up front because this could be one of the, the challenges that some of you have ideas about overcoming is the data around this. At the moment, we are relying on the registration of systems. But with us also being well aware that a lot of systems aren't formally registered, it's, it's very hard to keep track of this, um, apart from doing a kind of quite an expensive exercise of flying over and aerial photography and counting. Um, so any, any ideas around that would certainly be welcome. Uh, we've also, uh, through support partners, been providing direct support to businesses to really understand the technical and financial uh, information required around installing their own rooftop PV. Um, so that support is provided together with analysis of PV offers that are given to businesses to really enable them to implement rooftop PV systems. Uh, annually, there are also there's um, the development of market intelligence reports for both energy and the water spaces and the 2022 reports that have been over 10,000 downloads. So we're certainly seeing interest in those reports from various sectors of the market. And what those reports help with is they, they show where the trends are um, and where the potential business and other opportunities are, but they also show where the barriers are in the sector. And we certainly use that information to understand which systemic barriers we need to work to unlock. In terms of wheeling support, um, we've been giving support to seven municipalities uh, to develop draft frameworks and uh, wheeling tariffs. And we really see that as a way of keeping, uh, keeping energy and keeping uh, revenue opportunities open for municipalities. And then lastly, we've continued to support green economy investors landing in the Western Cape. Um, so we have the Atlantis SEZ for green tech, um, which really supports the landing of, uh, of green economy related businesses. Um, the figures from Westgro over the last 10 years has been 18 billion in FDI invested in the Western Cape, and that's just through 11 projects. And we continue provide, to provide direct engagements and support for businesses. So in terms of our core targets around municipal energy resilience, uh, at the moment we have a target for 500 megawatts um, of lower carbon energy by 2025. Um, 
with further additional targets of 740 megawatts by 2027 and a further 1,600 megawatts by 2032. Um, we've broken down just the, the shorter term target into what we think is achievable through municipal procurement, both the city's own projects um, and then projects outside of the city, and then enabling private sector projects. Um, the, the definition of, of how to divide up the sizes of the projects uh, varies depending on who you speak to and on which day you speak to them. Uh, but first, just roughly here, we've broken these down into under five megawatt projects, five to 100 megawatt projects, and then the REAP projects. And then we also have a focus on enabling infrastructure and systems. And these are required to enable any other infrastructure, um, rene renewable energy infrastructure to come onto the grid. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I'll speak to these just now. Uh, this is the structure of the MER initiative, so it's just a slightly different way of segmenting what we had in the previous slide. Um, I'll be going through each of these sections, um, but we have a focus on municipal procurement, so that's municipalities procuring from IPPs. We have a focus on enabling the private sector through various means on uh, understanding uh, the infrastructure requirements to enable infrastructure for this changing space, enabling systems, strategic development and management, which speaks more to our long term energy and electricity planning and our advocacy moves, um, and then support and coordination for the ecosystem as a whole. So on to municipal procurement component. So the first uh, of this uh, the structure here. Um, last year, in the last year and a half, we've undertaken um, detailed business cases. Um, we, this work is outsourced, so done by service providers, but with close working from the team. And that was really exploring multiple different technologies and different scales of technologies and understanding the legislative uh, requirements around each of those, uh, the financial uh, cost figures around each of those, um, and the capacity required to take each of these up. In parallel with that, we then undertook a municipal readiness assessment. Um, and this was purely to understand which of the Western Cape municipalities were most ready uh, to be able to look at uh, implementing or um, implementing renewable energy projects to scale. This is in terms of municipal procurement. Uh, so we looked at things like financial sustainability, technical readiness, uh, their policy environment and various other factors. That through that process, we came up with six candidate municipalities. Um, so those are Drakenstein, Sildana Bay, Mossel Bay, Stellenbosch, uh, Overstrand and Swatland. Um, we worked with those six municipalities as well as the six, uh, sorry, as well as the city of Cape Town. Um, to then take things forward. The understanding is always that we will look to have some kind of programmatic approach over time, um, but we want to rather work with one or two municipalities first up to be able to test certain concepts um, and land a different approach and then from there take it forward. We then undertook a request for information to the market and that was to understand where there might be mature energy projects um, already underway under development and understand what types of projects at what scales uh, were landing in which municipal areas. From that, we developed what's called pioneering projects for four of those candidate municipalities. And this energy projects report entailed a pre-feasibility study on each of those four pioneering projects as well as a fifth one, which is what's called a pooled buying mechanism. So I'm just going to skip to the next slide and I'll come back to this one. Is this pooled buying mechanism essentially looks at an organization or an entity where you might have multiple um, municipalities um, buying uh, energy from an IPP. That IPP would be responsible for accessing the required finance, designing, constructing and operating the plant. Um, and getting the various um, agreements signed off by ESCOM, NURSA, et cetera. But this structure, we currently um, are looking at a business case to really understand what the structure might look at, look like, uh, what could make it more viable, whether other municipalities should be added to this and whether they, it should include uh, energy traders or other private sector options as well. Um, so is there some kind of pooled buying mechanism that would reduce risk and reduce cost of buying um, energy from an IPP. 
Um, we've then taken into phase two, we're working with Stellenbosch municipality. It's kind of the first of the blocks. Um, and with Stellenbosch, we're providing transaction advisory support to take them through the inception, feasibility, procurement, commercial close and contract management phases of procuring from an IPP. We're also working with the city to support their procurement and commercial close um, of their IPP that's out in the market. As I said, the idea over time is to look at some kind of programmatic approach uh, for the province um, as it's deemed relevant. And in this last block is absolutely critical is um, municipalities are already very stretched in terms of providing uh, the electricity functions that they need to. Um, generally very uncapacitated, unfunded. Uh, they do have challenges in terms of maintaining infrastructures, infrastructure network, and to now lump a very different um, way of working onto them is, is quite a tall ask. So right through the process, we're looking to build municipal capacity. Um, with the candidate forum, uh, sorry, the candidate municipalities, the city of Cape Town and another four municipalities, we actually run what's called a candidate MER forum. So continually sharing the process um, for this municipal procurement component of work so that they can understand the complexities, but also so that they together with us can understand how to overcome those complexities over time. <clears throat> We've also been running uh, an MER fund. Um, this is essentially a fund which only municipalities in the Western Cape could apply to, and it was to do what we call foundational energy studies. The two main ones were the cost of supply studies, and that was really to enable municipalities to move towards cost reflective tariffs within their models to enable renewable in energy implementation at scale. So, for example, if they are going to set tariffs, uh, you know, feed in tariffs for SSEG or set wheeling tariffs, that they understand um, what it's costing them to run their current system, as well as uh, what, they, what other considerations they might need to put in place. Uh, to enable, but also to potentially incentivize uh, those systems. Electricity master planning is critical. That was more upgrading those or updating those electricity master plans in municipalities to really enable energy, uh, renewable energy at scale. So for them to understand and map out where they had grid constraints, but also where they have grid capacity. And the next step is then we we're busy um, with a project to understand the big pri big energy users in the private sector, uh, what their plans are for growth, what their potential energy demand growth projections are, but also what their current planned or systems underway already are for implementing renewable energy. And the idea is to link that work with municipal networks to really identify areas for grid strengthening, strengthening and expansion but also to help the private sector to understand where there might already be grid capacity and it might be uh, worthwhile areas for them to, um, to set their projects up in. Further in terms of the private sector work, we've spoken about this engagement uh, with the private sector. This support to energy sector and other businesses is for any scale, um, but for example, in the REAP space, it's really about um, looking to help particularly around local content requirements. Um, and we increasingly need to move in that space in terms of, of how do we link up the REAP project developers with local uh, content uh, uh, providers in a more effective way. In terms of wheeling, uh, these are the municipalities we've been supporting in the wheeling space, uh, but we recognize that we need to give that wheeling support to, to further municipalities and also help these municipalities to get their wheeling frameworks adopted and their tariffs approved. We're busy with a wheeling use of systems agreement, um, and that's essentially if um, a private sector developer or energy developer is going to use a municipal grid to wheel energy, um, that they need to have some kind of legal agreement signed with the municipality as to the ins and outs of that agreement, um, the, the charges that are going to be incurred, etc. Um, importantly, to try minimize any reinvention of the wheel. There is a national wheeling colloquium um, that's been set up um, and we now we've now joined that we part of that to really try to do this in partnership with others in the country. And then lastly on the wheeling side is we're busy uh, with a, about to embark on a wheeling revenue impact assessment model which is critical for municipalities who are still um, a little bit hesitant to move into the space 
Um, so to really understand what the revenue impact would be of not allowing wheeling versus allowing wheeling and being part of that system. What came up in a uh, recent, <clears throat> excuse me, energy workshop um, that we held, including external uh, stakeholders, was that we will need to look at supporting municipalities to invest in their wire businesses. So beyond what we're doing is to uh, further invest in municipal capacity, infrastructure, smart grids, etc., and including financial models, administrative systems. Um, if we really want to enable uh, or maximize SCCG and wheeling opportunities. Um, we also recognize that if we really want to incentivize the space, we will need to look at exploring and establishing fund some kind of funding or financing mechanism. And then lastly, in terms of small scale embedded generation, we have continued development um, and continual updating of feed and tariffs frameworks and uh, look to streamline the registration process if that is one of the blockages for the registration of the systems, otherwise better understand and unlock any blockages. And continue to support businesses to enable the take up uh, of. Uh, sorry, the implementation of renewable energy. On the enabling infrastructure space, um, so here the whole the whole shape of energy generation is changing quite substantially. So where the system has been designed for energy generation to take part in the northeast of the country um, and then to be uh, transmitted down to other parts of the country with renewable energy and where those resources are based, uh, infrastructure requirements then change. So the team here is looking at, or they sorry, they are already working with ESCOM, with municipalities uh, to map out and understand the current infrastructure uh, and the infrastructure requirements, and then really looking at uh, what is planned, what is funded, uh, what are the potential cost implications. And the next step will then be to look at uh, how we can in partnership with ESCOM, with financiers, with DFIs, etc., look at how we can fund the strengthening and expansion of the grid where necessary. Uh, the team is also uh, trying to better understand energy storage, so various options around energy storage and trying to understand the best um, applications for each of these, the life um, span of each of these, etc., uh, to understand where energy storage might fit into the space moving forward. <clears throat> in terms of enabling systems, um, our provincial treasury is looking to run work and the scoped out work on re-looking at the revenue models of municipalities. So at the moment, I mentioned they're very reliant on electricity sales. Um, so looking at what those alternative models might be. Um, and we're also looking to map out and well, we have been sorry, mapping out and we've been engaging with multiple DFIs financiers around the various financing and funding opportunities. Um, a lot of work still needs to be done in that space to then say uh, what is the project pipeline that we have and how do we link that in with the financing space. Um, on the demand and supply enablement side, uh, we continue to work in terms of localization of renewable energy value chains, primarily through the Atlantis SEZ, um, but also looking at how we can help with the implementation of the national, so the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan. And then the EV value chain work is largely being driven by the city um, with the support of Green Cape, but it's really looking at what the space is in the EV market, um, what of the component manufacturer could potentially be attracted to the Western Cape and how can we enable that to happen in the country. Uh, and then the last component to cover is really around strategic development and management. Um, so we are looking to put together a Western Cape IRP. Um, so based on the national IRP and based on the city's IRP, what is required in terms of uh, what is the picture for the province as a whole? Um, we need to look <clears throat> more. We recognize at uh, the power sector reform that's happening at national level. How does that impact and how do we link that to what's required at a Western Cape level? And importantly, how do we make sure we don't look to set up structures at a Western Cape level that would conflict or duplicate uh, what's potentially going to be set up as a, at a national level? Um, in terms of strategic positioning, there's still a lot of discussion around gas. Um, so is gas in, is gas out? Have we missed the boat or there is still a window of opportunity? Um, and so there, there, there are engagements with various parties, uh, including key municipalities. Um, to really understand uh, whether we just support where needed or whether there's still some active uh, driving that's needed in this space. Green hydrogen we see as a, a potentially big opportunity coming to the fore. 
Uh, the question again there is what we focus on in the green hydrogen space. Is it mainly for export and shipping fuels or do we uh, look down the line to use it as a form of relieving um, uh, or addressing energy resilience in the domestic market? Uh, either way, we need substantial uh, renewable energy to come on stream and so our focus will remain on uh, bringing or uh, enabling implementation of more renewable energy into the system. Uh, and linked with green hydrogen, we're also exploring uh, setting up the Saldana Bay IDZ as a, a potential focal point for green hydrogen. And then lastly, in terms of strategic advocacy, it's really looking at uh, the regulatory clarity and lobbying, uh, but in a partnership approach. Um, so where are the regulatory uh, changes needed at a national level? Um, who do we work with to try to push for those changes and how do we push for those in a constructive way? Um, so not about politicking, but but really about saying what clarity is needed, how do we enable that, et cetera. And the same with technical inputs into standards, regulations and legislation. So this is a summary slide, which I'll leave with you. I won't go through it all, all today, all now, uh, but it's just a summary of what's happening in the energy space, uh, where some of the changes are and where we need to step in uh, to make the change happen. And then maybe I just want to allow time for, for discussion as well. Um, so just to end off with this slide is just some of the complex issues we're grappling with and there can be key points for discussion here is, um, you know, alternative energy systems uh, from businesses or organisations, they can connect into the grid or they can go off grid. Uh, various arguments for either what makes more sense and how do we convince um, businesses, for example, to stay connected into the grid so that they're part of the broader uh, energy security system, but it also means that um, excuse me, that they can get some kind of recompense uh, for the investments that they're making. Uh, SSEG and wheeling, um, you know, there are various mechanisms in place, um, but what do we need to do to really upscale this? Um, but in a way that doesn't um, set ourselves up as, as government for failure down the line. Uh, what are the answers there? Uh, financing of projects and infrastructure, including uh, how we finance long term projects in the face of competing priorities. Um, so, you know, even just in the energy space, uh, motivating for renewable energy project that might take three to five years to land versus uh, hauling in a bunch of diesel generators uh, to offset load shedding. Uh, but broader than the energy space is, you know, there are huge demands for budgets um, from areas like education, health, um, et cetera. And how do we um, enable the financing of projects in that space? Um, for us, it's very much looking at what the potential financing opportunities are uh, beyond the direct uh, provincial and national government fiscus, um, but we'd really welcome any discussion in that space. Then number four is the collaborative solutions and meaningful partnerships. So it's how we really work with others. Uh, as government, I think we're very good at reaching out to others in a time of crisis. Um, and yeah, we perhaps fall a bit short in between crises. And so it's how we really set those up in a sustainable and meaningful way. And then largely how we affect change beyond this province. Um, so how do we more effectively work with national governments with other provinces? Um, we certainly do try to do that, uh, but any thoughts around that would be appreciated. Uh, yeah, so that's all from my side. Uh, but uh, yeah, Debbie, I'll sign off there, but perhaps I'll just leave this slide up as the last one for discussion. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, that was. Uh, Really great and really helpful to find out some more about the Western Cape's um, energy resilience initiatives and plans. Um, I'm now going to open this up for discussion. Um, if there are any questions, um, if people could just raise their hands or put their questions in the chat box or, or even suggestions um, for Western Cape government. Um, so, yeah, I'm putting it over to the floor. There are some questions in the chat box already, Debbie. Um, if you, yeah, if you want me to read them, you, I can't. Yes, if you, yeah, I can now read them. Okay, okay. all right. Um, so Mark has asked: um, Is the 1,600 megawatts by 2032 cumulative or additional to the previous horizon? Uh, uh, additional to the previous horizon. So that's where our outer year targets are ambitious and certainly we, we put less faith in those than the 500 by 2025. Uh, but what we are trying to get 
give a sense of is we, we need to radically upscale. Um, but yeah, additional to the previous horizon. Great, thanks. And then um, Anna um, has said, thanks, Helen, impressive work. Please, can you give some Western Cape examples of renewable energy local content supplies to understand that aspect better, opportunities and blockages? Yeah, thanks. So it's um, on the wind power side, the, the key focus at the moment here is on the, um, the towers. Um, but I think there are also blade manufacturers here on the PV side, um, various component manufacturers, and some of them are component assembly uh, businesses. Um, I think the, the biggest, one of the biggest blockages for a while was policy certainty. Um, so there was, I think it was a seven year gap between bid window four and five. Um, and so it didn't really give policy certainty in terms of attracting investors to the province uh, and to the country. Uh, to set up shop. Um, the change in the policy landscape and the movement in terms of the REIT program, I think, has provided better policy certainty. Um, but there, there's then kind of a bit of uncertainty um, around the extent to which local content would be required in those REIT programs. So there, there were substantial um, local content requirements for bid window five. Uh, but our understanding is that a um, little bit of a chicken and egg situation where um, a number of the suppliers uh, felt that they would need to uh, be granted exemption for those local content requirements because there was insufficient uh, supply in the country. Um, but we also understand that some of the suppliers for, hadn't actually been engaged uh, with the REAP uh, developers. Um, so a lot of the REIT projects, I think, were, you know, the, the bids were made based on the assumption that they would get uh, exemptions. Um, I think there's been a bit of negotiation and the I understand that the local content requirements uh, have been dropped quite substantially for bid window five. It's unclear at this point whether those requirements would be dropped further for bid window six, given that that's happening right now. But essentially, it opens up the space for really saying if there's policy certainty, um, how do we attract investors for local production as quickly as possible? But then on the side of the, the REAP uh, bid documents when they go out, it's, it's finding that sweet spot between how much local content uh, you require to really support a local industry. But the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan um, is trying to address that space, but I think we are in a bit of a transition space at the moment. I hope that answers that question. Great. Anna, um, do you want to add any comments to that or are you happy with, the, with your, that answer being, your question being answered? Yeah, no, that's very useful. Thanks very much, Helen. OK, and then uh, we've got a question from Bruno and then because um, Bruno. Thanks. Can I can I just sorry? One thing I forgot to mention is is what we have seen um, in the the last sort of six ten months or so has also been a, a significant increase in shipping costs. Um, so I think and and that then has a knock on impact onto uh, bid prices. So I think you know what is being realised, and this is globally as well. I think through the COVID pandemic is that with global supply chains, um, you're at risk of global supply chain disruptions. Um, and increase prices, transport prices, et cetera. Um, so a number of businesses are also starting to see the benefit in terms of if your supply chains are, are more localized, um, you're less susceptible uh, to some of those risks. Thanks. So you said Bruno? Great, and Bruno? I'm uh, Bruno Mervin here from the Energy Systems Research Group at UCT. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Looks like there's quite a lot happening in the province, which is great to hear. Um, you start your, your presentation seemed to be about energy resilience, but up until the last two or three slides, it, it sounded like it was mainly about electricity. Um, are you looking at what's happening to the other fuels like the liquid fuel, uh, for example, for the transport sector? Um, and then when you're in your various working groups, do you have one looking at and thinking about what the ESCOM grid tariffs could look like going forward in the future if more of the provinces um, start doing what you're doing and whether you can kind of 
rely on the current tariff structures or are anticipating that they could be changed, which will affect a lot of your business cases for, for doing projects in the province. And then, um, yeah, great that you're doing an IRP, but is it an IRP that you need or an IEP to take into account kind of a more um, a broader view of, of the energy needs of the province? And how are you integrating the various cities' own IRPs, like the city of Cape Town is doing its own IRP, and how does all that fit together with what you're doing? Like, sorry, quite a few questions. Um, I could repeat some of them if you missed some. No, no worries. I, I jotted them down while you were speaking, so thanks for that, uh, Bruno. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're spot on. We, we do call it energy resilience, and I think that's, that's uh, in a way, a bit of a hangover from the past work that's been done in the province is under the banner of energy resilience, um, which, uh, you know, when we start talking about uh, LNG and green hydrogen, etc., we, we're moving into the, the transport fuel space to a certain extent. Um, but at the moment, largely, you're correct, it is, it is primarily the, the key areas we're focusing are actually electricity, which speaks to, you know, IRP versus an IP at the moment, IRP, and it will be, it's on electricity. Uh, but we do recognise that we will increasingly need to look at the broader energy space. Um, further on the IRP, yeah, we're working closely with the city um, uh, in terms of the work that's just been undertaken for them that just completed um, and looking at how that's built into, how that would be built into a provincial system um, uh, as well as with Stellenbosch. Um, and we've been working with um, its garden route as well. Um, so trying to build all of those in and say, how would that fit into provincial one and then the national? Uh, how does that whole space work? Um, in terms of ESCOM and their grid, yeah, I mean, the, the team is, is working closely with some of the ESCOM teams. Uh, at the moment, it's more in terms of uh, the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, capacity as well as infrastructure planning and understanding the budget planning. Um, I think we do have a gap in terms of looking at uh, tariffs, where the where they are going, etc. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, we had a, a whole cabinet meets business event yesterday. Um, with I think it's about 140 people there, including uh, Andre Dereta was was the keynote speaker there. And so we were very open about uh, the Western Cape, the province's plans, and the city was open about their plans and what's underway. Um, and yeah, Andre Dereta was very much saying that we we are in alignment. Are they, you know, things change over time in terms of working in partnership versus where we potentially working at odds. Um, so what we were trying to have discussion on as well was, um, you know, in terms of relieving some of the pressure of, of load shedding and as a way of encouraging municipalities and provinces to, to be part of the solution in terms of more renewable energy, can there be discussion between, uh, you know, around the position of municipalities, including metros and ESCOM for potential relief if they're part of that solution? But yeah, that, that wasn't really responded to. Um, but I, I think it speaks into that whole space as to, you know, moving forward to what extent do we develop essentially parallel systems versus one integrated system? Um, and that's a lot of work that needs to come forward. So I think, I mean, you're asking all, you know, very critical questions, but I certainly don't have the answers though in terms of the tariff side of things. Thanks. Thanks. Right, Ad Vickers. Thanks, Davy and uh, hi, Helen. Um, so I have um, just a quick question on the, the pool buy mechanism. Um, in the, the slide where you discussed that you had the, this kind of multi-jurisdictional special purpose vehicle. Um, and it's, I mean, it's you, you've spoken about this before, but I just wanted to understand your thinking around this. Are you... Are you thinking this would be an entity that would be signing power purchase agreements with the municipality, sorry, with the IPPs and then have back to back PPAs with the off taker municipalities? Um, or is it, is it just kind of running the procurement program on behalf of the municipalities? You then sign the IP, so the, the 
uh, purchase agreements with the IPPs directly. Um, yeah, just just a little bit more clarity on on what the the SPVs, what the thinking is around the SPV. Yeah, th thanks, Vikas. Um, there are various approaches it could take. Uh, so the business case that's um, seeing in a kickoff in terms of development is really to look at all those different options. Um, so it's to look at do you need an SPV in between that acts as a go between or is that SPV in inverted commas basically just a centralizing of the procurement functions so that you don't have to replicate uh, procurement expertise, this type of procurement expertise in each municipality. Um, does the province play a role? Are we required to play a role or is this something purely that municipalities pull together? Is it something that would only make sense for municipalities with an energy demand above a certain amount to link onto? Does it make sense for municipalities um, you know, that are located further afield? Uh, to what extent would it strengthen some kind of pulled by mechanism if it included the private sector or does that completely complicate things? Um, so those are we, we've got way more questions than answers at the moment, uh, but it's essentially just looking at is there is there effectively a more efficient and cost effective way of doing this? Okay, and so just a quick follow up. I mean, the the timelines associated with this um, study to figure out these <laughs> this possibly optimal setup of this mechanism. Do you have a an idea of when? Yeah, well, we, we like look, to we're looking to have the information to then uh, be able to get buy-in and, and a kind of a, well, not really buy-in, more a decision taken by municipalities and province by the end of March next year. Okay. Um, so that would more be this, you know, here's all the inf here are all the options. This is the information on the table. These are the pros and cons of each of these options. Um, and at that point, we also need to see where things are moving nationally and in the private sector as well. Um, so the private sector certainly moves faster than than, than the public sector. Um, and if you know there's already been the start of various uh, energy uh, kind of trading platforms, and if that's moved far enough ahead and and that's more seen as you know actually let the private sector run those platforms and municipalities are potentially one of the off takers for those platforms and that makes more sense, then we would step back. same time, if you know, the National REAP office often has spoken in the past about, um, I don't know if it's really extending their mandate, but looking at other functions they could potentially take on. Um, and if that's moved by then, then that could change the position as well. So we, we're very much aware that the, there are a bunch of things happening in parallel, um, but we do think that we need to um, kind of look at things more closely on our side to then see how we respond moving forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Great, and um, we have a question from Eric in the chat box. Um, Eric says, many thanks. How are you leveraging climate finance instruments such as green bonds or the carbon market to fund transition requirements in the long term? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, great question. We are aware this is a, a big need, um, but we haven't yet moved into the space. So for now, we've just been engaging um, with various groups. Um, and I, th I think, I mean, to date we've engaged with about 20, um, so DFIs and or others, and those those have, to be honest, have all been reactive. It's been us responding to them being interested in what's happening in the province. So there's certainly a big interest, but what we've got to move towards is, is how do we then, um, uh, how do we t bring those on board? So we are working, uh, starting some work with the World Bank uh, to really understand a little bit more in terms of what the various options are. Um, but then more important, not more importantly, but in parallel with that, we're very aware that we would need some kind of uh, some kind of project pipeline or be aware of, for example, if we really wanted to scale up SECG or wheeling, what are the options around that so that we have something to take and take to these guys and engage, um, uh, engage with them. Uh, but there is certainly a big interest in South Africa, there's also big interest in in looking at a subnational level um, and different approaches that can all be part of of a bigger solution. Uh, so we recognise huge op huge opportunity, but we still need to move into that space uh, more decisively. Great, thanks. And then Mark has his hand up. Yeah, hi Helen. So 
Um, just regarding that sort of key point for discussion three, the financing. Imagine that financing of the actual generation projects is quite straightforward. And so is it more around the infrastructure um, that where the financing is, is is a challenge or you haven't or you've got to think about it? Um, just a question there. So yeah, how you sort of get act, how you how you deliver whatever's being generated into into the grid and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so I think it's a lot of it's around the infrastructure side of things. Um, so mun both municipalities and ESCOM, um, as we know, are very cash strapped. Uh, so if we do need to expand the grid uh, or to, sorry, um, more electricity infrastructure, whether it be the you know, any, any component thereof, um, if we do need to expand or strengthen um, the infrastructure, there, there is a financing challenge. Um, so it's looking at what the options are around that. Um, and then it's also financing mechanisms in terms of, you know, there, there certainly is an increase in terms of uh, small scale uh, projects uh, being implemented, wheeling being implemented, etc. But if we really wanted to incentivize that more, um, what are the different options that we could use to incentivize that? Uh, so if it's, for example, an increased feed in tariff, uh, but municipalities can't necessarily support an increased feed in tariff, are there different ways of bringing in climate finance, as an example, to fund an increased feeding tariff, even if it's for, say, a three year period, but enough to, to make a business case uh, for people to be willing to invest, um, but really at scale? And for wheeling, how do you reduce the wheeling charges? Um, so you incentivize more wheeling or provide more price certainty as well. Because I think a lot of a lot of the the fear from both businesses and households has been uncertainty around putting systems in, and then there might uh, be a new or an increased uh, connection charge that's added in, uh, or the feed-in tariff looks quite favourable, but then over time that feed-in tariff gets reduced quite heavily um, for rooftop PV. Um, so all of those would feed into that that space of financial mechanisms. Great, and we've got a question from Kay, uh, from Anna in the chat box: Is how is the Western Cape government engaging in just energy transition um, partnership negotiations? Uh, thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, this question came up yesterday as well as the at the um, Cabinet Meet Business event, um, and I need to do my homework a bit more in this space. But essentially, um, so our Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning, um, they're the part, part of the broader team that's engaging in JET, JP. Um, so I need to get feedback from them in terms of where things are at there. Um, essentially, you know, a lot of a lot of the discussions in the country and the, the potential funding for that are going to be focused uh, more on the, the regions in the northeast uh, where there's currently, you know, the current electricity, coal-fired electricity production, um, and then down now in the potential of job losses in those areas. Um, but there there is also work uh, being driven at a national level to, and by others, to look at the, the non-kind of jet focus areas. Um, to look at how do you also stimulate opportunities in the renewable energy sector um, in other areas in Western Cape would fall into into that area. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid I'm a little bit out the loop on that side, so I, I certainly need to do a bit more homework there. OK, great. Um, I don't see any more questions um, in the chat or hands raised, and we have used our full hour slot. So um, yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Helen. Um, it was uh, really great to have you present um, as our first presenter in our new climate and development webinar series. Um, I believe the presentation will be available afterwards, um, shared with us, so we'll be able to share that with others. Um, and yeah, we hope to be able to chat to you again, maybe in a year's time and see how things are progressing. Great, th thanks very much, Debbie, and thanks to everyone uh, for being here and engaging. Um, yeah, and I certainly welcome any questions uh, beyond this as well. So particularly if people have suggestions uh, around, because we we certainly have gaps in the program of work. Uh, some of those gaps we're well aware of, but we're just needing to to focus our resources on, on particular areas, but some we might not be aware of. 
Um, and some areas we might see as gaps, but you know of other people who are working in those spaces. Uh, so the more you can share with us there, we really appreciate it. But otherwise, thanks very much for your time as well, Debbie and, and everyone else. Great. Thanks so much, Helen. Great. Cool. Goodbye. Yeah, cheers. Bye.